Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. Michael Freeman. If you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live tapings, please check us out at youtube.com slash user slash Curve of Anarchy on Mondays at 9 p.m., 6 p.m. Pacific. And you can see the final product on the same channel, youtube.com slash user slash Curve of Anarchy on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Curve of Anarchy. If you're here during the live taping right now, you can post any questions or comments to the new thread we've made or send us a Facebook message and we'll certainly get to it. And now a word from our sponsors. Holly Cogburn runs Homebody, a body care, vanity, and cosmetic products company. She contracts using USD, Bitcoin, and barter. She is proud to say that she started the business without the assistance of bank loans. In her words, fuck bank loans and fuck their interest rates. For the most part, fuck banks. She has paid her startup costs out of pocket and has steadily and sustainably grown from there. She believes in a free, fair, and reputation-based market, relying on word of mouth. So please, find Holly at homebodyco.com or facebook.com slash homebodyco. Now we're back. Uh, so Michael, very special guest, a uh, very big name in the anarchy movement. So... Yeah, throw it over to you. Cool. Right, we are. We do have a big guest tonight, and uh, he's a happily a busy guy, and I'm glad that he's busy because he's he's helping change the world, so I don't have to. Um, <laughs> and this is he, it's Jeff Berwick. You guys might know him from the Dollar Vigilante, um, one of my favorite podcasts, Anarchasts, uh, on on YouTube, etc. And an upcoming event that I believe starts tomorrow, um, Anarchapolco. So, Jeff, how are you doing tonight? Uh, a little stressed out uh, here, right? It is it's starting tomorrow, and uh, as I was saying to you, I'm so stupid. Uh, when I put this in my schedule like three weeks ago, I, I noticed it was the day before in Arcapoco, a fairly big event here. It's, uh, it's pretty much sold out, 300 people at least. And I thought, I'm always the kind of person, I, I, I never plan things very well. I never think about things very well. And, and I, I thought at the time, I thought, oh, it'll be no problem. I'll just do this podcast just the night before in Arcapoco. And I've been running around all day, and I have to go out later tonight and make sure everything's ready to go for tomorrow. Uh, but I managed to make time, and I'm glad to be on with you guys. I like your program. Great. Appreciate, appreciate that. We, uh, <laughs> we like your stuff too, man. Um, yeah, so, so you want to explain to us, uh, at least for the viewers, um, what is Anarchapolco? Uh, Anarchapolco is essentially uh, the first international anarcho-capitalist uh, conference of its type. I don't know of anything else that's been done quite like this, uh, or not even close, really. And uh, so it's here in Acapulco right now. Uh, starts tomorrow. We're going to have uh, uh, three days of workshops before the conference. Uh, one's with ExoBase, which is run by ExoSphere, which is essentially an entrepreneurship work camp uh, they, they, they teach people how to be entrepreneurs um, and then after that we have Luke Krodowski, James Corbett and Dan Dix all on and they're going to be uh, doing a workshop called Change Media University and they'll be giving all their advice and tips on how they've all created uh, very large media on the internet they're very well known of course James Corbett's uh, Corbett Report, Luke Krodowski of We Are Change and uh, Dan Dix of Press for Truth uh, all three amazing organizations they're all going to be there at one time teaching people how they do what they do and I think we need a lot more people to do this kind of stuff and um, get this information out there more uh, and uh, it's all very uh, popular all these things and then we also have Dana Martin uh, unschooling workshop peaceful parenting and unschooling for for people who want to learn a little bit more about how they can uh, have a more peaceful uh, relationship with their kids uh, why you don't really even need school at all if you don't want to send your kids to school and how it actually works so much better um, and things like that and then then the conference starts on Friday uh, and it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and so I am not going to get much sleep this week. I'm not <laughs> going to be answering many emails, uh, and I'm just hoping to survive it all, really, because it's going to be, I'm going to be at the conference from 
nine in the morning till probably two in the morning every night, uh, and it's going to be some drinks involved. There's going to be parties, and we have uh, rappers coming. Tatiana Moroz is here. I was just out with her last night, and or two nights ago, and uh, they're going to be performing on the beach. Uh, so it's going to be quite a quite an event, and um, and it's like I said, it, it's been quite surprising to me how popular it's, it's become. Uh, when I first started it six months ago. It was just an idea, and it's almost like just put it up on the internet and just see what happens. Uh, I do a lot of stuff like that. I'm kind of an entrepreneur, so I, I test things out. It's like, well, let's just put it up and say we're going to do something and just see what the reaction is. You know, if no one reacts and no one comes and nothing's really lost. And uh, right off the bat, it was quite popular, but it's been in the last month or so that it seems to have just gotten this huge amount of buzz. We've had people like Right Said Fred, remember uh, I'm Too Sexy? Uh, they, they were on Twitter saying, oh, they wish they, they, they could be there, but they, they have other obligations. <laughs> I've got contacted by all sorts of amazing people, uh, and people are still right now even coming and registering right now, uh, sort of last minute, sort of people signing up. Um, so yeah, it's been quite the experience already, and it hasn't even started yet. Wow, yeah, I, I, I really do wish that I could make it. Uh, as we were saying before we went on air, uh, New England winters are, 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 are something harsh, and to go down to Acapulco, Mexico for a Liberty event sounds, uh, <laughs> I mean, it I'm intrigued, right? Um, so yeah, I think there's a few former Currency of Anarchy guests who are going to be down there. Um, Dollar Vigilante contributor and Anarchast in Espanol um, host uh, Luis Fernando Mises, I believe, will be there. Actually, I don't think he's going to make it. I'm, I've oh, been really? talking to him every day, and he, he waffles back and forth, some sort of budget issue. Uh, he might make it still, but he's still on the fence. Oh, no, okay, okay. I take that back. I'm sorry, Luis. Didn't mean to put you on the spot, but now you have more of an incentive to go. <laughs> um, Lauren Rumpler, Objectivist Girl, was on the show a few weeks ago. She's going down there. Um, yeah, I'm actually a big fan of Luke Rudowski. We are changed. He, he does really, really good work. I know that he doesn't exactly call himself an anarchist, but... His yeah, he does, he's an anarchist. Uh, he, he doesn't li li like to you know be out there and use the word and say he is one, but... Um, I've known him for about a year now, and uh, he's uh, uh, he was on Anarchist, and he he's just essentially is an anarchist, but he he doesn't like to use that word too much because he doesn't want to. He he's trying to get truth out there, and he doesn't want to scare people with certain words. You know, some people think the word's a really dangerous word or something for some <laughs> ridiculous reason. Uh, yeah, there's so. another guy going down there uh, who has the same feeling. Mark Edge, the uh, co-host of Free Talk Live. Yeah, Mark was on Anarchast as well, and he'll yep. be here. He'll be co-emceeing with me a little bit, and uh, yeah, he's also like Luke in that he's got a very, quite a large, uh, very large radio program in the U.S. They're number 44 of all talk radio shows, which is quite good, for, and especially for an anarchy or a freedom-related show like they are. Uh, they're on so many stations, and they're all over there on satellite radio and stuff. And uh, yeah, he was the same as Luke. He was like, yeah, you know, I am an anarchist. Obviously, I'm a I'm a good person. I, I don't uh, <laughs> believe that we should have a world where uh, we use violence and force uh, with other people, and um, but he just doesn't like to use the word. He calls himself a voluntarist, which is fine. I don't, I don't care really about what word you call yourself as long as you are one. Uh, you are a morally sound, peaceful person. That's all I really care. Yeah, I actually use the word anarchist a lot because. My sort of style, as you may have noticed, is I like to be a little bit provocative sometimes. <laughs> I like to, you know, sit here and smoke and drink and and be a little, you know, you know, sort of like a little different, you know, and sort of put things in people's faces sometimes. So, uh, for me, the word anarchist. I do. Is, I do yeah. know. I do know. <laughs> <laughs> I do know. <laughs> and I'm over that's here. That's, that's why. I use it. Yeah, I like to be provocative as well. Um, Josh is the is the neat and pretty on our show, and I'm the one who's just going to tell it to you straight. Um, <laughs> I like bad words. I like drinking. I like to to wrestle some jimmies, as it were. <laughs> yeah, I've wrestled a few jimmies, I think, in my life. <laughs> yeah, you've been doing this for for quite a while now, I think. Well, yeah, it, uh, it depends how you define doing this, but. Um... Uh, even when I was back in the 90s, before I even knew what anarchy really was, but I still was an anarchist. I just didn't know there was a whole philosophy behind it. I didn't know what the word even meant. Um, I, I had a large uh, financial website in Canada. It's still the number one financial website in Canada. It's called StockS.com, and I would write my sort of provocative ways on there too. Um, just for people who don't know, if you want to be in media, uh, you have to say things that are going to rustle people's jimmies or else no one's going to care. Uh, if you're just saying very plain things all the time or writing very plainly, 
people just don't get interested. So you have to find ways to kind of catch their attention. So even back then, I was I was very well known as as, as saying some really extreme things, uh, which I believed in. Like I, I don't say these things because I'm trying uh, to get attention, and I don't believe them. I actually believe them, but I'm not scared to say them either. And I I, I found in the media business, and I've been in the media business uh, pretty much my whole adult life, uh, and now with the Dollar Vigilante. Uh, is that you? You need to, you know, make your niche. You need to be say something interesting in an interesting way, or you're, you're just never going to get much of an audience. So, so that's the way I am. I have no problems uh, saying anything uh, that I believe. Um, and to some people who haven't heard these things, it sometimes it kind of shocks them, and that's fine. And that's actually how you get their attention sometimes. Yeah, definitely. Agreed. I mean, um, well, what do you got? What do you got, Josh? I know you're a you're a big Berwick fan too. What do you got? Well, I, I'm I mostly come from the you know economic standpoint, I guess, uh, because I mean Michael and I uh, actually met this weekend in person, and we touched upon the fact that you know he comes at it from the social side, I come at, come at it from the economic standpoint, and um, you know, I come at it I come at it from the anti-social side. <laughs> point, point taken. Um, but I, I think Jeff, uh, you kind of epitomize both ends of the spectrum here. Um, yeah, when I first uh, got into this sort of angle on things, freedom and liberty and anarchism, the the first thing that really got me uh, uh, my eyes open was the economic side, um, because I had just gone through the tech bubble. I started a company in my house. Uh, a year later, three years later, is worth $240 million. And then uh, a few months later, it was worthless. <laughs> and I was like, what just happened there? And I talked to like MBAs and all these people who went to all these schools, business schools. I said, what, what happened? And they're like, well, that just happens sometimes. I'm like, no, no there's something more. <laughs> like, it doesn't just happen. There's, there's a reason that you have these huge booms and these huge collapses. And uh, so I started reading. I think the first book I really read that really kind of opened my eyes was The Creature from Jekyll Island. And uh, I was just enthralled because... I was like, whoa, this is like the information I was looking for, and no, hardly anyone seems to know about it. But this is back in like 2000, 2002. And back then, hardly anyone even knew what the Federal Reserve was. Uh, it would be very rare to ever meet anybody who even knew how uh, the money system worked, how the fiat US dollars work. And uh, now it's becoming quite a bit more well known thanks to the internet. Uh, but that's how I first got into it, and I was so blown away by it that I just uh, went and read everything I could, Austrian economics, and then that led me into, uh, uh, and then I also was uh, friends with Doug Casey, uh, because he was one of our top people we had on our website in Canada, and it was the biggest website in Canada, so when he was in Vancouver, he'd stop by and say hi, and we went for dinner. And uh, I was telling him, yeah, I just found out why th these bubbles all happen. He's like, oh, yeah, you didn't know that? I'm like, no. And, um, and I said, i got to tell the world about this stuff. Uh, and he, um, then he said, well, you know uh, what you are, don't you? I said, no. And he said, well, you're a libertarian. And I didn't, I'd never heard that word before. I'd never heard it. And uh, I thought, what, like liberal? He's like, no, libertarian. You, you believe in freedom. And I was like, yeah, of course. Like, what, who, who doesn't believe in freedom? <laughs> and he goes, we talked a little bit further, and he goes, you know what you are, don't you? And I said, no. And he goes, you're an anarchist. And I was like, like a lot of people who watch these shows who haven't heard that word before, I was like, what, like people who bomb buildings and stuff? Like, <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's what the government and the media say they are because they're scared. If people become anarchists, then there won't be any government, and all the mainstream media will be gone too. And... Uh, and so I just read, and I, I still to this day basically do, I, I find the whole, everything, not just the economic, the social, everything, so exciting. Uh, to me it's, like a lot of people say, oh, a lot of things you're saying, they sound sort of negative. I'm like, no, it's like the most positive thing you could be talking about is how we can change the world so easily, so much better, there'd be no more war, uh, there'd be very much less poverty, um, So it'd be so small that you wouldn't even notice it. And, That's a really uh, good point. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, <laughs> it's a good thing. We're what we're talking about is actual progress, not the stupid liberal leftist uh, skewing of that word. Like, we're talking about progress and innovation and the forwarding of humanity and 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 the the forward promotion of society as a whole. I think that's probably <laughs> one of the best things you can discuss. And I would think. Yeah, and a lot of people will say about us that uh, what we're talking about is dangerous, yeah. and. You know, life uh, is dangerous, um, and uh, I think we are talking about something that's so far off of people's radar because they've been indoctrinated through the government schools their whole lives. They watch the mainstream media, which is basically just the marketing arm for the government, 
And so uh, when we say something like, well, we don't think there even should be a government, that blows their mind so much that they get scared. They're like, well, what would it be like? And, you know, if they're rational and, and open to ideas, we can say it would be a million times better. I can guarantee you. There's no way it could be worse. Uh, and... Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's sort of funny that uh, they're always trying to say that what we're talking about is dangerous and all that kind of stuff, when actually the most dangerous thing ever is a government and central banks, and uh, they're killing people every day, every minute of every day. Someone's getting killed by a government somewhere, and someone's definitely being impoverished by both the government through taxation and through the central banks through inflation. And so what we're saying is we don't have to do it this way. We can have a, have a much better system. Uh, it's actually a non-system. And uh, so it is, it is it's funny how how many people still think that well, what you know anarchy is dangerous and uh, but it's it's mostly brainwashing from the government and the mainstream media and the schools uh, the schools a big part of it and uh, they always throw in the word anarchy whenever there's a riot they go it's anarchy here and yep. it's like that's not anarchy <laughs> grab your pitchforks bunch of communists who are fighting the government so which is both um, you know essentially government <laughs> I'm not sure that they're actually uh, telling. Uh, you know, something that's fallacious. Uh, it might actually be dangerous, but only to the government. You know, like these anarchist and libertarian ideas. It's actually really bad for them. I mean, well, it's actually it really great for us. But. It often is bad for them because a lot of the people that we'll be talking to will be 65 years old. They're on their social so, socialist insecurity check. Uh, <laughs> and what we're talking about is uh, we want to just stop doing that. And they're like, well, I'll, uh, you know, I have no food. I'll have no food to eat. And it's like, so it is dangerous to certain people. Uh, the if. If we changed today and there was no more government, there'd be a lot of people who'd get hurt in the process because they're not uh, prepared for that, and they put all their faith, and and their income comes from the government. Uh, so <laughs> it'd be a period of time for sure where it would be very uncomfortable for a lot of people, and that's why they also probably think it's dangerous. So in in a sense, I think we really need to find a way to move slowly towards anarchy. I don't think it should just happen in one day. Um, for example, I've I've been having these ideas lately, and maybe I'm crazy or maybe I'm stupid or uh, have, and maybe I'm like a you know pie in the sky sort of dreamer but you know we could almost just uh, if we could convince enough people that this is a much better way to go maybe we could do some sort of a deal with government and we say okay we're gonna wrap this thing up in the next five to ten years it's gonna be next this year we're gonna close this department next year we're gonna close this one you know and just sort of move it towards it and as that starts to happen people will see how much better it is all the time and maybe they'll want to speed it up after a period of time but, uh, you know, it's, it's the old sort of debate, how do we transition from this horrible status world that we have today to uh, one that's much more peaceful and prosperous? And, uh, and um, that's, that really is the question. A lot of people have these ideas like, oh, it'll be, you know, maybe just like civil war and chaos for, for years. And it, it is possible. Uh, the, all these things are possible. So that's why people say that uh, the, these ideas are dangerous. I guess in a way they sort of are. Uh, but to me, the end result is what's the most important and fixing all these problems. And I see the way the world is today and where it's going, especially with the dollars going to collapse in the next few years, the yen's going to collapse, the euro's going to collapse. That's going to be way more dangerous than anything that we've been talking about. Um, see, I'm a button pusher. I'm not a minimalist. I think that I need to push a button and end the bitch <laughs> as soon as humanly possible. Well, if there was a button, I'd push it for sure. I know. Unfortunately, there, there's just like, not, it doesn't exist. We have to come up with some strategies on different ways that maybe we can get the ball rolling more. To, um, to go on to your point about <laughs> people who are at risk if they end the state. Um, so first, again, I am a button pusher. I will press that button and end the state if that's possible, right then and there, regardless of the outcome. And I'll do it in public where everybody can watch me do it. <laughs> um, but I am one of those people who gets an income from the state. You know, I have a, a military pension, right? Um, so if the state ends, goodbye rent. You know, and I'm even so with the atrocities that government commits, it kills more people than any other institution that has ever existed in all of humanity. I'll make times that a thousand, times a million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'll still press the button. You know, and just like the word anarchist, I think people don't understand what it means. Like you didn't. They think it's Molotov cocktails and and burning the the barns down, right? And burning witches at the cross or something like that. But they don't understand what the term means, and I'm not making excuses for the nationalists. Don't take me the wrong way. Um, but I think that if these people understood what the state actually is, then they would vehemently oppose it like I do and, and have hatred towards it. 
not not only for the fact that it is inefficient, and it is, it's one of the most inefficient things ever. It's completely unaccountable to the people that it provides services to. Um, but my problem is is a moral is a, I have a moral issue with with the bitch rather than a an efficiency issue. Yeah, no, I, I do as well. Um, uh, I, I see all the different angles. I, every angle uh, that you can come from on anarchy, I can see them all. I can understand them all. Uh, it, to me, it's a very moral issue as well. Um, I, for some reason, we, even when I was younger, I always, like, for example, I was like the number two white rapper in Canada in 1989. Really? Yeah. Do you have a link? Do you have a link for it's that? It's called the Jeff Steele Crew. It's on YouTube. It's very embarrassing. Oh, I will certainly be looking that up. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, in Canada, Canada is so ridiculous that they um, they make the radio stations play a certain amount of Canadian music on the radio, and it's like more than fifty percent. So all you really hear is like Alanis Morissette and Brian Adams like all day long playing. <laughs> And uh, they actually give grants to musicians because they want more Canadian music because, you know, that Canadian music culture is so important. Uh, we have to hang on to whatever that is that uh, we, we should steal money from some people and give it to other people. And a lot of people said, you know, you could apply for a grant and you can get easily $5,000. You can make a video. Uh, you know, back then it was much music in Canada. I think they still have it. It's like MTV. And I was like, no, I'm not taking I – don't, I don't ask for charity uh, from anybody. And I, well, to me, it wasn't so much the government. It's just like I don't, I don't want anyone's charity. I want to earn it on my own. And so I was always like that. And I actually did once take a government check. Uh, well, actually, I worked for the government. My dad got me a summer job in a like I was a sewer worker, which was not a lot of fun, but it paid quite well. And so I did work for the government then. And uh, then when I was laid off of, uh, I think it was from that job or another job. Uh, I had been paying into unemployment insurance, which is done through the government in Canada. And so when I got laid off, I took the unemployment, uh, whatever they call those checks you get when you're not working, for I think four or five months before I found another job. So those are the only two times I could think of that I've ever even really received anything from government. Of course, I've probably given them, I'm just going to guess here, not given obviously, I was extorted, but it's got to be well over a million dollars uh, throughout my lifetime uh, because of all the things I've done. So I don't pay it anymore though, uh, all legally, uh, because I don't live in Canada anymore. Um, but uh, so yeah, I, I've uh, I've always been sort of against uh, anything to do with government, even though I didn't even really understand why at the time. I just didn't like it. I just didn't make. I didn't like that someone was giving me money for something I didn't really earn. Um, it just didn't make any sense to me. I didn't. I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. Yeah, un unfortunately, in um, I don't know, 2005, I was either duped or negligent. You can call it whatever you want to, or just a poor decision maker. Maybe um, joined the military. I was active duty for for six years in the army, um, and it was a bad time. And I I'm still trying to figure out what comes next. You know, um, but right, but but so so. So I, I, I collect government money, too. We've all done it, I think. Um, Josh used to help the government build bombs or something like that. So <laughs> Actually, there was another time I worked for the government. I forgot about this one. I got out of high school, which I didn't even want to go to, but my mom made me. And uh, she signed me up for the Canadian Naval Reserve for, like, the summer. So it's like the, uh, I guess it's two months sort of a boot camp or whatever they call it. And the funny, funniest part about that was we lived in the prairies, like nowhere near any ocean, not within like a thousand miles. And I was in the Navy in a place called Edmonton, Canada. And man, I hated it so much because, you know, you know, just the way that they treat you. And I was just like, oh, this is ridiculous. Why am I even here? And and um, so that was another time I forgot about that one too, but I hated it. It really wasn't much money either. It was incredibly low amount of money. Um, but uh, I got out of that as soon as I, I guess I, I think I did graduate. I don't know what they call it, graduated or whatever. <laughs> and uh, and as soon as I, they said, okay, you graduated. What, what do they call that when you get it through basic training? What do they call that? Graduate. There's a gra I think there's a term yeah. for it. Anyway, um, whatever the term is. Like I I I'd gotten through basic training, I guess. And they said, oh, you, you did good. You know, like everything you did, except for you never polished your boots or something. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Like, so what do you want to be? And they're like, you could be a diver because you were like one of the smartest and fastest and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I was like, no, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm out of here. And like, <laughs> they were shocked because, you know, I was one of the best guys apparently. And uh, I was like, no, this is fucking horrible. Oh, can I swear on your show? I don't know if I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I encourage it, actually. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. Josh, didn't you almost jo Josh? You almost joined the military too, huh? 
Uh, no, no, I never almost joined in. No, hell no. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, I am not a fighter. It wasn't ever going to happen. But uh, before <laughs> I continue with my familial story, I just want to mention that uh, Luis contacted me and said, yeah, he'll uh, be joining Anarcho Pulco for next year. Uh, oh, and he loves you, Jeff. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I just want to... Yeah. <laughs> About three or four years ago, I... Um, uh, I left a job that was um, a defense contractor. I w I'm a software engineer, and they uh, created software for boats and planes, uh, communication of uh, Link 16 and Link 11. Um, it's uh, just really technical internet, you know, scrambled messages, basically. So um, that, that's all I did, but, you know, after a while I started realizing how... Um, basically fucked up it really was because it's just violence and I mean anything in government is violence obviously but it's just it was so like it started eating at me even though I was I was just in a cushy job you know in a cube you know writing software it, but when you start thinking about it it's really all all we're doing right now at least is attacking you know as the United States you know they're attacking countries and you know, oh. it's basically tyranny. You know, I, I hate saying we are attacking. You know, I, I'm not doing a damn thing. And, right. You know, I'm an anarchist. Yeah. Fuck that. But, um, yeah, I, I could never join the military. Hell no. That's not in my blood at all. There's one time we were, it's like Canada, right? Like almost northern Canada, really. And um, <clears throat> we were, we went, to, we went out to a lake because, uh, you know, there's no oceans nearby, and I was in the Navy, so we had to go you know, <laughs> near, near some water somewhere, I guess. And uh, it was, uh, in, in Fahrenheit terms, I don't know Fahrenheit 100%, but I think I got this close. Uh, during the day one day, it was around 85 or 90, and that night it got down to pretty close to 35 or 40. And uh, the first half of the group got, like, heat stroke when we're doing our 10-mile march in, like, all these packs and all this heat and uh, the guys who made it through that the rest all got pneumonia or some of them actually went crazy I, I forget what the term is but like when you get super cold or super I'm not even sure but one guy was seeing things he was just losing his mind he was he was screwed up and I was like one of the only guys who just survived it all somehow and uh, so yeah that was another interesting waste of time and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in the navy, in the navy, in a landlocked area, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, oh man, it's so ridiculous. Uh, it's called HMCS <laughs> nonsense. Uh, I guess it's HM is like Her Majesty's. I don't know that cunt. Her Majesty that cunt. <laughs> uh, um, and they actually, they, you go to the, like it was just like a warehouse. That that was our base, I guess they call it. And uh, they just have like pictures of boats on the wall. And it's like, hey, when, maybe one day you'll be on one of those. It's like, well, no thanks. <laughs> now, how um, how free is is Canada compared to America as far as I don't know, economic freedom, social freedom, et cetera? I think the better question is how unfree is Canada compared to <laughs> the U.S. Uh, they're too, both too very. Shy. You know, Canada used to be okay. I didn't mind it, even though I didn't know I was an anarchist at the time. I've always been like this. And I just knew that uh, when I was younger, I could see the U.S. I could see what was going on there. Um, and I didn't like it as much as Canada because it seemed like they were really pro-war all the time. It's like, yeah, hoorah, let's go get them. And I didn't like that at all. I was like, well, who are they, <laughs> first of all? <laughs> no one really, but we want some oil or something. We just want to make some money. It's like, I'm not really interested in that. And Canadians were very kind of... Back then, they were very unpatriotic in, in general, although they always would brag and they'd always pulled their chest up high when they say, Canada has free health care, and that always bothered me. But, but in general, they weren't like passionate and patriotic. And like You'd go to a hockey game, which is normal, and uh, they'd have the national anthem. Half the people wouldn't even stand up. They'd just be drinking beer and waiting for the hockey game to start. Now, uh, ever since about 9-11, um, the Canadians have almost become more... Uh, patriotic than the Americans. Uh, they you, you can't even hear the uh, singer at the hockey game singing the national anthem because everyone's yelling it at the top of their lungs. Uh, they're they're excited that they went and saved Afghanistan, which they didn't. Uh, <laughs> some people went and killed a lot of people, but didn't yeah. help anything. 
Uh, they're they're happy to be involved in Syria. Yeah, we have to help. You know, like stop this problem of the CIA created uh, ISIS, which is basically run by Dick Cheney and 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 <laughs> funded by him and. And uh, we have to help, you know, because we're Canadians. We're good people, and uh, you know, we are Canadians. We're very proud of that. And I'm glad I got out of there around the time when it really started to get more patriotic. Because I, I would not be standing at the uh, national anthem at a hockey game, and I'd probably get beat up now. That's how much has changed. Um, so when I do, if I do, I don't really go to these things much anymore. But if I do, I try to show up after the national anthem because I don't want to get into a fight over nothing, over you know, brainwashing. Um, and I'm not going to stand for it. There's no way I can. There's just no way. I, I hate. I, I, I watch hockey on TV. I'm Canadian. I'm from Canada. I like hockey. It's very great. <laughs> you guys are from up north too, a little bit. You probably like hockey, or, or maybe you don't. But uh, uh, when I watch it on TV, when the national anthem comes on, I just mute it or change the channel. I can't even look at it. It, it makes me sick. Yeah, I, I really hate that song too. Um... Oh, well, the Canada one's and bad. I, the, the U.S. ones is really bad. It's just talking about, yeah, we're bombing things, and look at all the bombs <laughs> and how beautiful they are. It's like, uh, what? And yeah, the Korean right. ones were like, oh, it's the land of the free. No, what are they called? I forget the words to it. It's really stupid. The land of the free and the home just of like, the brave. Pay your 50% taxes, and you, know, you can live in the land of the free. And uh, In general, Canadians seem to be a little bit more polite in general. Uh, I hate generalizing because, you know, uh, you know, uh, obviously, not everyone is, and in general, um, I've I've just sort of noticed this. It seems like Canadians are a bit smarter uh, about some things. Like they haven't been so brainwashed. They actually know something about like world news and stuff, even though the news is mostly wrong. But uh, you ask an American, like, and they can't even point on a map where any country is other than the U.S., Iraq, Afghanistan. And I think that's basically it. Like that's and China, <laughs> our owners. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so uh, some people like Canada. Uh, I'm, it's not like I hate Canada. I don't hate the place. I don't hate all the people there. Um, I don't like the government at all, and I don't like any government. Uh, but in general, it's gotten worse and worse up there. I think uh, people are going to really see more and more of that. Uh, I can see the progression of what's going on. They're really, I think they're trying to put in this North American Union more and more. I can even see that here in Mexico. Um, Mexico I love because it's like you ask your average Mexican like hey are you really patriotic They're like well I'm a Mexican yeah but that has nothing to do with the government or anything it just has to do with you know dancing to music and eating tacos and drinking beer um, but uh, they're not like nationalistic that, that way not in that way they have a certain uh, some people here are that way but they're, they're not like we're gonna go attack this country or we're gonna you know you know, all that kind of war sort of related sort of stuff. And, and no one really likes government. If you ask almost any Mexican I've ever asked, like, what do you think about government? They're like, I hate them, right? Uh, yes, that in Canada, the U.S., you're going to get a lot of different responses, and not all of them, or not many even, are going to be, I hate the government. So it's, yeah. Well, it could be better. I think we could change it, you know, in, in two years. I'm going to, I think it's, you know, we'll have, then we'll have <laughs> I can't even well, say it's, this well, it's not the worst. Hillary Clinton and uh, Michelle Obama will be the vice president, and I think that'll fix things. <laughs> and because then, when people have a problem with government, they'll all be uh, sexist. Uh, whereas right now, they're all racist because if they don't like something the government does, and you know, we'll change it. And uh, but here, there's there's very little talk like that. Like people really don't even talk about the government. They just wish it went away. It's almost like a nuisance. And and the government here also doesn't really get super involved in day to day lives of people. Like there's really not much cops here. If there is cops, they rarely bother people. Um, and in fact, if they do bother people, sometimes the cops will get killed because people are like, hey, get out of here. You know, like they don't like them. They just get out, get away from us. And uh, and then people in the U.S. look at that, which and they'll go, oh man, there's like three cops were killed today in Mexico. What a it must be anarchy down there. It's like, well, it's getting close, like it's closer to anarchy here, but that's not what anarchy is. Uh, but uh, the people look at it negatively in the U.S. Or if a mayor, I think a mayor got killed here a few months ago, and it was in the news in the U.S. And people are like, oh man, that's a sounds like a very dangerous place. It's like, no, they they just don't like governments, and and uh, so it's different different. Uh, Mentality, I, I um, like I I love Mexico a million times. Not not the government, but just the place in general, the style, the culture, uh, more than the U.S. and Canada by further than I can even express um, because it's just so so much uh, less government involved in your life here and a lot more uh, private uh, enterprise without much regulation and um, and so I I much prefer that of course. I mean. 
<laughs> beer, beer, and, beer and tacos are two of my absolute favorite things. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty hard. I don't know there. many people don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you had real good tacos in Mexico. Uh, they're amazing. Uh, <laughs> when I first uh, came here, I ate tacos for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day for about two months straight. I just <laughs> It's so good. I just give me more of those things. Uh, I don't eat them as much now. I'm kind of more used to it. But, but yeah, it's just, you know, I, I just prefer it down here. Is that culture um, against government more pervasive in Acapulco, or is it just basically all of Mexico? Yeah, the one thing that people don't seem to realize is Mexico is a huge country. It's very large, and uh, so it's just like anywhere, like the U.S. Uh, people in Boston are very different from people in California, are very different from people in Florida. It's, ver it's very similar in Mexico. Uh, down here in Acapulco, it's sort of like the southwest, and I really call it the deep south of Mexico, and they have this almost like a tradition, a history of hating government, and uh, so even the president or yeah, the president, they call him president here, a prime murderer or something, of Mexico. Uh, even up until a few years ago, he wouldn't even come here because he'd be too scared for his life because they don't want to see him here. Like, just don't get out of here. This is basically their, their uh, perspective. And so, yeah, down here is probably why I like it so much. I've been all over Mexico, and I just found, like, there's this real culture of uh, individuality, of freedom, of... Uh, being very strong, uh, it's, it sort of goes back to the Aztec days, and uh, and they just don't like government much. I don't know anyone at all that that likes government. They might um, vote because just like in the U.S. or Canada, they're like, well, this guy's really bad, that guy's worse, so pick the better one, and then maybe it'll be a little better. Uh, but uh, it, I don't I don't know, even know how many people vote in Mexico. I'd be surprised if it's very many, especially here in Acapulco. I doubt there's uh, – the only people who probably would vote are probably more like the communist uh, style. There is some commies in, in Mexico, and uh, they're trying to take over the government right now. Uh, if they do that and it actually turns into a communist government, I'll be out of here the next day. I don't think they're going to, though. Um, so, yeah, it's different places, different perspectives, different uh, uh, things and issues, but it's just so much less government involvement in your life here. Like, it, you just rarely even see anything to do with government, and I love that. Um, like, no cops, really. Like, they fired most of the cops in Acapulco in the summer, and uh, everyone's like, awesome, great. <laughs> and uh, it's been so much better. It's like the traffic's much better because they're not pulling people over for stupid little things, and... Oh, and so yeah, it's just a, a different place, and but that's the main reason I like it so much. And plus, of course, then you have the weather, which is awesome. This is one of the best climates in the world. Uh, if you like hot, like warm weather, uh, every day is sunny and and 85 degrees every single day of the year, and um, cheaper. Yeah, it's I notice. Uh, I notice you've got like a sunburn except for around your eyes right now. Yeah, and I don't even try to. I don't suntan or anything. It's just like my house is pretty much half outdoors because uh, it's always warm. Like right now, it's probably 70, 75 degrees, and so you're just in shorts all day. And the house is sort of like a lot of it's just sort of outdoors. It just has like a roof, so the sun doesn't shine on you and stuff. So I'll be in the sun even if I don't leave my house and don't even try to get in the sun. I'll be in it quite a bit. And uh, for people who don't know, vitamin D is one of the most important things to your health. And uh, many people, especially up there in places like New England where you get like, cold winters and stuff like that, you're, you're probably very low in vitamin D. And it is the most important, in my opinion. I'm no doctor, uh, but most doctors are idiots who are, you know, not all, but a lot. Um, and uh, uh, people are, are surprised at how important vitamin D is to your mood, to your health. And uh, so if you're even up there in, in uh, New England area or whatever, I, if I if I lived there and I I wouldn't but if I did I would go to a tanning salon probably once or twice a month just to get uh, some vitamin D flowing. Yeah, good point. Yeah, Actually, there is not much sun going on up here. Yeah, <laughs> my girlfriend is uh, black and uh, she's starting to have to take uh, um, uh, vitamin D supplements. I, I'm not highly suggestive of it, but um, you know it, it's what she's got right now. So. Yeah, yeah, I think if you can't get to a tanning salon, uh, try the supplements and see if they work for you. I've never tried them. I'd pr I always prefer to do things naturally, and of course, a tanning salon isn't totally natural, but you know, it gives you the effect that you need to get the vitamin D. Um, and, but here in Acapulco, of course, I, I just walk outside for a few minutes and get. Um, you know, I, I really I can't believe how healthy I've been because I've been really stressed out the last year or two. I've had 
number of business deals go sideways. I've been robbed, not not robbed, but you know, defrauded mm. numerous times. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of people were starting to question my re reputation and stuff because of some things that I had nothing to do with. And so for the last year, I've really been drinking a lot. I'm smoking like crazy, uh, and I don't really eat much. Uh, and I'm never sick. I don't. I don't understand how it's working. But I, 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 because sometimes I'll go up to Canada, or the U.S. in the winter, and I'll do the exact same things. I'll be drinking and smoking and not eating much, and I'll be sick in two days. So I think the vitamin D is very important. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's funny because the government and the media have been really trying to keep people out of the sun for decades now, right? Um, and I think it's one of the most important things to your health is to get some sun every day if you can. And uh, they, they go through these things like, oh, no, there's an ozone problem. You're going to get skin cancer. Um, but uh, and then they say, oh, put all these chemicals all over your skin. That, that'll, that'll keep you safe from the sun. Pretty much everything the government and the media tells you is the opposite of what you should do, really. Uh, definitely get some sun if you can. Right. Yeah, my, my my first one of one of my first principles is to not trust the the state narrative on, on any account, no matter what it is. Yeah, that's a good uh, uh, sort of principle to live by. You can't go too wrong uh, doing that. Um, uh, I was gonna try to do a George Carlin quote there, but I'm gonna just gonna screw it up. Yeah, I so I'm not gonna. <laughs> I butcher quotes too, so I won't try either. Yeah. But, uh, maybe someone's got Google there, but I know the quote you're talking about. <laughs> um, now, what's what, what's the the region like the the geography down there? Like, are there mountains? Is it all islands, or you know? Here in Acapulco, it's like I've been to about a hundred countries, and uh, I consider this to be number one or number two most beautiful place I've ever been in my life. Uh, the the one that kind of competes with it is Rio in Brazil. For natural beauty, um, it just everything's all colors all the time. It's just green, and reds, and yellows, and you know the plants, the flowers, the uh, the the birds, and uh, it's this whole bay is surrounded by mountains, uh, and so that's beautiful on its own. It's a huge bay, and it almost goes all the way around. It's almost like a complete circle. Uh, so it's beautiful in that way as well. Uh, and then you've got the blue water, you got the blue sky, and all these colors every day. And uh, so I consider it almost to be a magical sort of place because it, it never rains either. That's the funny thing. So it's it's always lush and green, and just mangoes are just falling off trees everywhere because there's so much. Everything grows so easily here. And uh, it never rains. Uh, so the, the, I think there's a huge aquifer underneath Acapulco or something uh, that just keeps everything super green. So it's really a, quite a – if you ever get the chance to go, I would highly recommend it. It's one of the most interesting and beautiful places that I've ever been. Now, earlier on you mentioned that there are already about 60 people down there for in Acapulco. Um, are you – I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is too forward, but are, do you think it's going to happen next year too? Um. Yeah, I think almost for sure if I, I'm still alive at that time. <laughs> um, I have a lot of very negative feelings about the next year coming up. Uh, I, I don't want to say too much. I don't want to bring everyone down too much, but I see major collapses happening. I see wars uh, increasing, uh, Russia especially. <laughs> Uh, who's being surrounded by the U.S. right now, and they're they're getting pretty close to doing something very serious there. So I'm not planning too much a year ahead from now, but uh, it's already been a huge success this conference. Uh, we uh, the the hotel we booked and the room in the hotel can only hold about 300 people. And I thought there'd be no way that we'd get 300 people here. And uh, it's basically sold out. We actually might be overselling a bit right now. So if you do register today or tomorrow, and if there is no seats, uh, please you know, stand. You know, uh, Just be aware that, that we might be a little bit over capacity uh, at this moment in time. But uh, I think we're going to fit most people in. And uh, it won't be every speech will be full anyway. And uh, I just I, I just don't want to say no to people because I you know people are writing me they're like oh my god I'm this is like I'm looking forward to this so much it's going to be the biggest thing I do all year and I just don't want to say oh no sorry it's sold out so we're just trying to get as many people in as we can and, and see if we can make it work which I'm sure we can there are, everyone coming not everyone but most people coming down are really cool people they're laid back they're anarchists they're they're not uptight about every single rule and and you know the, uh, regulation and all that kind of stuff if something's not quite perfect I think most of them will be fine so. Uh, so yeah, the, to answer your question, if I'm alive, if the world still generally works or exists next year, uh, we'll definitely do it again, and I think it's going to be huge. Um, I think we'll talk about thousands of people next year but from what I hear from everyone I talk to. Yeah. Um, if, if you get uh, more people than uh, 
you know, capacity than just have them sleep on the beach. I mean, why not, right? <laughs> It's not about the hotel rooms. Uh, I think there's still rooms available, but it's the conference room can only hold about 300 people, and I think oh, we're at, at, right around that number right now. Uh, oh. So I, I'm, a, you know, I'm, you know, it's my conference. I'm stressing out a bit. I want it to go perfect. Uh, uh, so that's one of my concerns. It's like, oh, I hope we we have enough seats for everybody at, at in in the room. And but you know, I think everyone it'll all work. It'll all work out fine. I think. Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree with you. Um... If it happens, you know, I think we're all going to die is really what I think. Josh is a little more optimistic than I am, but at this point I really think we're all going to die. Um, so, right, if we're still kicking around, then then I'm going to try pretty hard to get down if it does happen next year. But I yeah. don't have high, I don't have high hopes. I, I can't say that I do. Yeah, there's yeah. so many day. black swans right now in the sky that it's almost dark. <laughs> you know, like there's so many things can go wrong right now. There's so many problems, all caused by government, central banks. Uh, you know, we're going to see the Japanese yen collapse any day now. Not any day, but probably this year. The euro is very close right now with what's going on in Greece again. Uh, the U.S. dollar is going to collapse, of course, but that will probably be the last one to collapse, in my opinion, except for maybe the Chinese uh, yuan and the Russian ruble, which if they back it with gold, it might survive. And that's sort of what they're planning. You can see that they're planning that. So uh, then there's uh, all these wars that they keep starting. Um, they're really trying to get something going on over there. Uh, you can see it with this ISIS thing in Syria, uh, Libya. And, of course, General Wesley Clark said right after 9-11, which was done by the same old cast of characters, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and all these guys, um, they had a list of seven countries they wanted to attack in the next five years. And Wesley Clark's talked about this. He even talked about this recently. He said, yeah, of course, so they had a list. Uh, they haven't done it as fast as they thought they would, which is actually good. So it kind of shows that, because uh, it's taken them now, what is it, 13 years, 14 years now, and they've only attacked about four or five of the seven. And the last few on the list uh, are Iran is the big one. And yep. they've got them surrounded right now. And... Uh, Something's going to happen. Something crazy. Uh, Russia, they're, they're starting to move in on Russia now um, with what's going on in the Ukraine where the U.S. government overthrew the government in a coup, tried to install a U.S.-based government right in the, in the doorstep of Russia in a place that's always been associated in one way or another close to Russia as is their neighbor, essentially. And the U.S. is just moving in there, just bringing in all these weapons and... Uh, some something's going to happen, and I don't think it's going to be good. And uh, so I don't plan very much in the future right now. No, it's not going to be good. And let's say it's the dollar collapse. Um, I'm fairly certain that the government will legitimately kill everyone rather than let the dollar go down. And that's not going to. That's just not something that I want to be a part of. Um, <laughs> like I don't blame you for going to Mexico, dude. I don't like. I've I've been to war before. I don't want to fight. I don't want to bleed and and just it's going to be a shit show. It's going to be nasty and and they have much much bigger guns. Um, oh, with all the stuff they have now, and you can just see yeah. them cracking down every day on just they're, they're collecting all your data. They know where you live. They're they're uh, tracking every single thing you do through every single electronic device you have. Uh, there's going to be some. If if they they succeed, this is going to be crazy, and uh, uh, it's going to be bad one way or another. Uh, there's really no good way out of what all the statism and central banking has caused over the last hundred years. Um, it's either going to be really bad or horrible <laughs> for a period of time. Yeah, and not if necessarily it does, in the world, but most places, in my opinion. If it does get good, um, there's going to be a bloodbath before before that happens. I think. Yeah, there's no way to, to know how this is going to play out. We've never had empires this big before, like the U.S. empire. That's a e military base in pretty much every country in the world, tracking every single person in the world. Uh, and it's going to collapse, actually. That's the good news. Like, there's no way this empire lasts too much longer. That's really good news. But how it collapses, it's going to be really a rough transition period for a lot of people. It's either going to be, like you pointed out, a total bloodbath, uh, FEMA camp style stuff, <laughs> or it's going to be dollar collapse, which gets rid of the U.S. government pretty quickly, but they'll try to keep control by trying to force people to do things. There's enough Americans with guns and hopefully some brains left that they don't uh, allow them to do that, and they fight back if they have to. I'm not for violence ever, uh, even in the case of government. I don't want to violently get rid of government. I want to peacefully get rid of uh, government 
Uh, but if it didn't attack me uh, to the point where I was life and death uh, in a situation, I would definitely fight back, of course. But I don't. I, I always try to leave that as the very, very last option. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. I'd if I can if I can not be a part of it, I'd rather not. I'd rather sit it out. Yeah. I'd, Just to, I'll to, defend to my. <laughs> yeah, seriously. You guys, you guys go do your thing. Let me know how it works out. And, uh, <laughs> see, have a good one. <laughs> Honestly, I think that's why I have gold and silver because it's the peaceful way out of a dollar system or any fiat system. You know, it's uh, it's the way to trade without the government. You know, and in my opinion, course. I mean, there's also Bitcoin and other altcoins. Um, but you know, that's. I mean, I'm not totally there, but you know, eventually, Michael and I, we gotta, we gotta trade in Bitcoin, man. <laughs> um, well, that's the yeah, funny um, thing, right, with Bitcoin that we always talk about is all of us guys who love Bitcoin because we see what it is. It's a a, a completely free private money um, that can't be controlled by governments. Uh, the problem with us is that we don't like to spend our bitcoins uh, because we, we just want more and more of them because we see them as being very valuable and going to be much more valuable in the future. So that's been an issue. But I think there's so so much of a bitcoin ecosystem now. We're going to have so many of those guys here at our event. Roger Veer, the Bitcoin Jesus, Cody Wilson, uh, 3D printed guns and dark wallets and trying to shut down uh, Bitcoin. Uh, coin foundation right now which is awesome uh, so many great uh, people in the Bitcoin space and uh, the eco ecosystem the economy of the Bitcoin is growing so much that I think it's going to grow and I think it's going to do very well I don't know how we get you know how it's going to get there but I, I, I think it's going to do quite well and uh, it's going to be so important because we're going to have a lot of these currencies collapsing just imagine if this Greece thing really blows up and it totally has the potential to Oh yeah, and the euro essentially collapses. How many people in Europe might be starting to get interested in Bitcoin at that moment in time? <laughs> uh, you know, like it was Cyprus that really uh, set Bitcoin off from thirty-five dollars to about one hundred and fifty dollars. What was that two years ago now? And uh, that was just Cyprus. That was like a little tiny island that really didn't matter. It wasn't a big global issue, uh, and their banks shut down and took most of the people's money, uh, the government. And uh, and uh, that spiked Bitcoin like 500% higher. So you can imagine if Japan does or Euro, uh, you can't even imagine the numbers. It, it's going to be tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars of Bitcoin. Uh, and I'm not predicting that, by the way. I don't know if it's going to get there, but it has the potential to. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, um, while we're on the subject, I'm just going to go over the prices as of uh, tonight. Yeah, last time we did this show, we skipped uh, last show because... Um, we had technical difficulties, but um, so the last show we aired was February 9th at 5.55. I took those prices, and tonight is February 23rd at 8.38 silver. Uh, was 16.99 tonight. It's 16.36, so that's down 63 cents. That's 3.7 percent. Gold went from 12.38.40 to 12.03.97. That's a 34 dollar 43 cent drop that's 2.8 percent and Bitcoin went from 220.95 to 238.59 that's 17.64 that's 8 percent if the calculation is right that sounds wrong but anyway yeah, Bitcoin's doing uh, quite well, in my opinion, um, for everything that's been going through and all the problems and. Um, you know that spike really was an unnatural spike that went went over a thousand. In my opinion, in retrospect, you couldn't recognize it at the time because you didn't really know what was going on. It's like, why is it going up over a thousand dollars now? Is something going on? And in my opinion, it was the two things: it was Cyprus, and then the Chinese just got into Bitcoin like crazy around that time. And Chinese people in general are traders, they're speculators, and and they went just nuts on it. And I think that's what really spiked it. Um, I feel really comfortable with Bitcoin around these levels. I feel like it's a really solid level. Level for Bitcoin. I went under 200 there for a little bit, um, and I thought, you know, I was telling people, you know, just privately, uh, I would be buying here for sure. I, I can't see it going under 100. I just can't see it. Um, it's possible. It's totally possible. But I, it's been really hanging in at a, around this number for quite a while now. And as we were just pointing out, there's nothing but growth for Bitcoin in the future. Um, and as people start to use it more, the value of it will go up. So uh, I, I'm very comfortable. I also, th uh, silver at this price, I think, is incredibly cheap. I think it's an opportunity. If you don't have any yet, now is pretty much the time. Um, I'm, I was surprised it went under 20. 
Yeah. And, uh, gold also is uh, gold's really been hanging in very strong now for over a year at around these levels. So it could be time for it to take off again too. So and I don't see it going down. I uh, I really I can't see it going below a thousand. It's possible. I can't see it. Yeah. Right. I uh, I've been into silver and gold for about five years now, like on and off, and um, it, it really surprised me. Well, I bought silver. Um, like I bought three 10 ounce bars uh, about four years ago, or maybe f no, 2009 I think. And then I sold them uh, when it went to it was going up quickly, and I sold them around forty dollars. So I nice. doubled my money doing that. You know, I mean it's only three bars, but you know that's pretty awesome. You know, and it got me into this whole silver and gold thing. And um, I mean, yeah, you're right. It, all three of them have potential to just go through the roof, but essentially because fiat currency is crap. So anybody who doesn't have these currencies right now will get into it. Therefore, the demand will rise and the prices, in theory, will go up compared to the fiat currencies. Yeah, I think the amount of Americans who own gold or silver is something like almost nothing. Um, yeah, like 5%, right? Or less, even I think. Um, and once the dollar starts to collapse, you know, the, there's so many things that could just set these things off to the moon, really. And it's not like I don't think you're going to get like you're going to be like wealthy, like a billionaire, uh, just because you bought some gold or silver right now. I don't think it's going to go up tens of thousands of percent. Uh, Bitcoin could though, uh, but I think. Uh, what's going to happen over the next couple of years? Uh, the people who lose the least are going to win. So if you it, get through what's going to happen, and it's going to happen, I can guarantee you it's going to happen, uh, that uh, if you can survive with something, with some gold or some silver or some assets, uh, you will be in a position where uh, you can, for example, during Weimar Republic in Germany, the uh, I don't know if this is an old wives' tale or not, but it wouldn't surprise me. So they had their hyperinflation, and apparently at the end of the hyperinflation, uh, one guy bought a hotel. I think it was Hyatt or Hilton or one of those guys uh, for one gold coin uh, because that guy needed the the uh, the money. Um, so uh, I think it's not going to be so much about making tons of money as everyone's going to lose so much that you'll look rich. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, I think we lost Michael. Um, but, um, yeah, any uh, final thoughts, Jeff? Uh, do you want to plug yourself in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, sure, I'll plug myself. Why not? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm mostly just stressed out right now. I've got this big conference starting tomorrow. Uh, Narcopoco, if you want to come down last minute, if you don't mind standing uh, for some of the speeches, uh, you're very welcome to come. Uh, it's uh, starting actually on Friday. Uh, so if you're up there in the snow and cold, uh, check it out at narcopoco.com. Uh, if you don't know much about anarchy or if you want to know more about it, I have probably the top anarcho-capitalist podcast interview show in the world called Anarchast. Uh, we're almost at our 200th episode. We're just surpassing a million views right now, which isn't a ton, but it's it's growing a lot. Uh, it's really good. Anarchast, uh, just find it on YouTube. And then I, I read The Dollar Vigilante, which I've been doing for quite a while now, talking about the coming uh, fiat currency collapses and how to protect yourself, and that's just dollarvigilante.com. Right on. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, and uh, I know Luis uh, was trying to get in touch with you, but uh, um, yeah, you just went through me. Um, and yeah, so the next show... Uh, I may not be present for the next show, and that will be uh, March, uh, no, yeah, March 1st, I believe. So, um, yeah, uh, check that out. That will be the roundtable discussion. We're going to have Marky Ballantyne back for the first time in like five months, six months. Um, uh, the usual suspects, you know, uh, so check that out with Michael. Um, I may be there, I might not be. Uh, again, Jeff, please, um, thank you very much for coming on, and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure, man. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Uh, keep up the great work. I enjoy your show. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.